for the story of salvation. And even as we look all the way through Scripture, Scripture really is a, n a narrative about uh, your salvation history, the, the fight that's taken place all the way from the beginning of man until even today of uh, the search for salvation. And we know that it only comes through you, and it comes through you because of what Jesus did on the cross. So as we lead into the weeks coming and Holy Week and, and truly celebrating, even coming together to celebrate your death, because we know without a death there couldn't have been a resurrection. So we, uh, with a heavy heart, celebrate that in the hopes of looking forward to Easter Sunday and your resurrection, because we know how the story ends. Those that were there in that day didn't know how the story was going to end, but we know today how the story ends. And we thank you for the opportunity to uh, be able to reach out to you and to seek you and allow you to embrace our lives. We thank you for all you do. We give you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said together, Amen. You may be seated. The children may go at this time to their class as well. Again, we're thankful for the children's ministry. If you know of families that have kids that aren't attending church, um, invite them. Let them know that we have something for their kids as well. We love the kids. We love seeing them even walk out and, and head out to class. So uh, blessings on them. Amen. Amen. Praise God this morning. The spring equinox, first day of spring. But we're here to praise God this morning. And the Psalms is known as the book of praise. So continuing in Psalms, we're going to read Psalm 36 today. So Psalms was written long ago during the golden age of God's chosen people. And it was written as an aid to worship and to give praise and worship to God. So it was both private and congregational. And uh, our scripture from Psalms is an honest observation about bad people, but also about great faithfulness of God. And, uh, well, Darlene has called me Mr. Critical. I say, well... That's just an honest observation. I wasn't being critical about that driver. I was just making an observation. Oh, yeah, 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 right, sure. So the first book of Psalms includes the first 41 of the uh, Psalms. It was collected during the time of King David and used in temple worship. And so one of the striking features about the psalm is the depth of emotion, the emotion that is put on the page. And so the Lord hears our pleas, and he works in our hearts and through our circumstances. So he knows our emotions. And so we grow in the fruit of the Spirit, by, uh, by being um, by being given certain types of uh, trials in our lives, but this is to grow the love, joy, peace, patience, and goodness, kindness, and uh, gentleness. Okay, self-control. And also faithfulness, of course. That's not in order. I'll let Pastor do the in order. But more than any other book of the Bible, though, Psalms explores the personal nature of our relationship with God. And that relationship, we're reminded in some traditions, this being the third week of Lent, the time of of enlightenment and purification coming up to the time of the crucifixion. So, but as you remember, King David <coughs> was a warrior. He 
he slew Goliath the Philistine when he was just a young lad, and he was known for being a great warrior. But uh, here, Psalm 36 is a prayer for God's unfailing protection from the wicked. He wrote in Psalm 33, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. Psalm 36, for the director of music of David, the servant of the Lord. An oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of God are wicked and deceitful, he ceased to be wise and to do good. Even on his plots evil, he commits himself to his sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. So let's give God praises this morning, Lord. As we come into your house to give praise, Lord, we just thank you for what you have done, what you have accomplished, the hope that we have, Lord, through you, the hope of life and blessings and abundance, new life coming. Lord, we give thanks. We praise you, Lord. May you come again soon, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. As we continue in our series, One True God, for those that are maybe with us for the first time today, we've been going through the characteristics of God and really looking at scriptures and trying to pull out of scriptures how we can know that God is the one true God. And we have much in scriptures that lets us know that. There is one capital G God and there are many lowercase g gods. And we are striving to serve the uppercase God. When Moses went up to the mountain with the Lord, the Lord gave the Ten Commandments. And the very first one, it says that you shall have no other gods before me. You should put no one before me, no thing before me. So in order for us to truly understand this relationship that we're supposed to have with him, we need to understand his characteristics. We need to understand who he is, how we approach him. And we've talked about him being omniscient and omnipresent and immutable and all of those different things, that he's holy, that he's set apart, that he's, that he's always been and always will be. He has no beginning or end. The scripture says he's the alpha and the omega, the first and the last letter of the, of the alphabet because he's always been. He just didn't fall into being one day. He's always existed and will always exist after this. And that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. 
because we live our these lives looking at we have a certain amount of years to live on this earth and and we've kind of been conditioned that we are born, we live, we die, and it's over. And yet that's not the reality of life. There is a, a spirit presence that lives forever. And, and our spirit goes to one of two places. And that's not determined by a mean God who says, I'm going to create a place for um, other people. It's truly from a loving God who says, I want you to choose me. I want you to serve me. I want you to love me because... But if you don't, there's a consequence to that. Because there's going to be another place. There's kind of this mindset in our society today. Well, if you just do good, if you do good and do enough good things, you're in like Flynn. And that's not the way Scripture reads. The Scripture tells us that we are to be in a relationship with God, that we're to seek Him with everything that we are, that without holiness we won't see the kingdom of God. I've tried to help us to understand in the simplest form that holiness is a daily quest for God. It's us daily seeking to learn more about Him. It has nothing to do with us being perfect because we're not. He's the only one who's perfect. It has everything to do with He's made a way for our imperfection and yet in the midst of that imperfection, He wants us to seek Him with all of our heart. When we get to the New Testament, the disciples ask, what is the greatest command that you would give us? He said, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In other words, love God with everything that you are. And the second, like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do these things, then everything else will take care of itself. What he's telling them is all the, the law that was given, the Ten Commandments, that if we love God with everything we are and we love our neighbor as ourself, we'll fulfill all of those. Because if I love my neighbor, I'm not going to go over to his yard and steal his motorcycle out of his yard because I want it. It's not going to happen because I'm going to care for my neighbor. I'm not going to go over there and and rip his grass up because maybe he came over and ripped my grass up. It, it, that's not the way it works. We're to love God with everything that we are and love our neighbor as ourself. So as we look at this continued process of understanding God, when we have relationships with each other, as we learn more about each other, those are the things that we appreciate even more. And the more you get to know someone, the more you get to appreciate it. Also, sometimes the more times you find their faults, and, and we all have them, and, but yet we're supposed to be looking for the good in people. So in order to do that, then we grow in that relationship. To grow in our relationship with the Lord, we have to understand who He is, how He functions, and then we can begin to be able to love Him even more. So today we're talking about God is faithful. God is faithful. The word faithful comes from the Hebrew word aman and from the Greek word pistos. Both words communicate an idea of certainty or stability. So you get that certainty and stability. So when you think of His faithfulness, think of those words, His certainty, His, st his stability. An appropriate illustration would be a strong column that holds up the weight of a building. You think about the story of Samson. You remember Samson's demise? He was in this great auditorium and, and there were pillars holding up the roof. And, and so think of those pillars. God is that strong pillar that holds everything up. Now Samson cried out and asked God for help to knock those pillars down. Why? Because when you remove the pillars the roof caves in. Think about that picture for a minute. If God is faithful, if He is our stability, if He is our pillar that holds everything up, when we start to knock that pillar away, then we destruct everything else. And our relationship is not what it should be with Him. Another way to look at it would be the way a father would uphold his child or, or protect his child or a mother would protect their child. Remember before the days of seatbelts? Anybody remember those days? Remember before the days of having kids and 
car seats and strapping them in and and putting a lock and latch around them and everything in the back seat. They, for, I mean, terrible parents were we, they rode in the front seat. And you'd be driving along, and anybody remember you're driving along and you got your kid in the front seat, and, and sometimes even your spouse, and all of a sudden you have to stop quick. What's your first response? I mean, for, you, you, for those that are younger, don't understand that because you don't have to stop people from flying around because they're restrained now. But at that point, it was like, you're, you're cruising along, man, you put your arm out. Like, my arm is going to hold my 40-pound, 50-pound kid from flying through a windshield. But that's what I thought at the time. I mean, but, but it, it's that strong arm that reaches out to protect a child. That's our God. When the word faithful is used to, in regard to God, it means that he is worthy of absolute trust. You remember what my favorite verse is? You've heard it a few times now. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You remember how it starts? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. That's absolute trust. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him to be your strong tower? Do you trust Him to be that protective parent when you're a helpless child? It tells us that He is worthy of absolute trust and that His people can depend on Him without doubt or reservation. That's hard, isn't it? How many here have doubted God at times? Let's be honest. I've doubted Him at times. He doesn't deserve to be doubted. He's faithful. He's faithful. This next statement that I'm going to make, if you don't remember anything else today, I want you to remember this statement. Because I think this is where we truly lose it sometimes and don't understand God's faithfulness. God is faithful not because He does everything that His people desire, but because He does everything that He has promised. Do you hear that? God is faithful because how how many times have we said, how can God be faithful when He didn't work in the way that I wanted Him to work? How can He be faithful when I was going through this and He didn't protect me? How can He be faithful? It has nothing to do, His faithfulness has nothing to do with Him doing everything that we desire. But has everything to do with everything that He has promised. He says He'll be with us in all times. He says that he, he won't depart from us. But He never truly does in Scripture tell us that He's going to take away our trouble. Matter of fact, there's a portion of Scripture where He says, in this world you will have trouble. Expect it. God bless you. Expect it. It's going to happen. So, why do we question when we have trouble, why do we first question the faithfulness of God? How many of the things that we go through in life we, do we go through because it's our own fault? Or maybe somebody else's fault? The wages of sin is death. We are imperfect people, we make mistakes. When we make mistakes, there are consequences to our mistakes. There's nothing in Scripture that says that our faithful God will remove our consequences to our choices. He's purposely given us a free will so we can make our own choices. He wants us to love Him because we want to love Him, not because He's up there like some drill master telling us what to do. So what is trust? Trust is putting unmerited, blind faith in someone that sometimes we don't even know everything about. But that's what I'm trying to help us, to understand what He's all about so we know that we can trust Him. I've told you many times throughout this this series that 
Um, the character of a person is regularly revealed by the name that is put to them or before them. So here are some names that have been given to God. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, The faithful God. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, it says, The God of the, God of the faithless. In Hosea 11, 12, The Holy One who is faithful. And in 1 Peter 4.19, he's spoken of as the faithful creator. We have time after time after time after time in scriptures that people speak of his faithfulness. He was faithful in leading the Israelites into the promised land. He was faithful. They didn't go in when they were supposed to because they were unfaithful. Not because he was not faithful. So how is it described in scriptures in Psalms 36, 5? That it reaches, his faithfulness reaches to the sky and extends a great distance. So his faithfulness reaches to the sky. We're finding out over and over again that there's more up there than we ever knew was up there. As they're able to explore further and further that the space is a, a, a great expanse. And it just keeps going and going. And I can't wrap my head around that. How can it just keep going and going? There's got to be a beginning and the end, right? But there's not. They're just finding more and more out there. No green people hanging around out there, if you think that's what it is. But they're finding more stars. And the Scripture says that God is faithful beyond the limits of the cosmos. Other scriptures talk about he holds the stars in his hands. So these stars that are too great for us to even count and even see, he knows everything about all of them. And the same is true with each one of us. In Psalm 146.6 it says his faith is forever. It's important to understand that God's faithfulness not only depends upon his character, but it also depends upon his power and his immutability. Remember, we talked about he was immutable. What does that mean? He does not change. He does not change. God, A God of limited power would be limited in his ability to fulfill his promises. An immutable God would change. He would change over time, just like they say everything else does. And we look out and things do change over time. But God doesn't. So in Psalm 135, 5, it says that He is all-powerful over everything. In Isaiah 14, 24, it says everything that happens is according to His intent. God works all things together. Sometimes we forget a word in there. God works all th things together, we like to say, for good. He says, our God works all things together for the good, according to His riches, according to His glory. So there's difference between working things out for good or for the good. Because we know sometimes before something is good, it has to be bad, right? Right? I've been helping Brandon and the folks at the Journey do their their remodel of their sanctuary, and and it it looked okay to begin with, but then we started tearing carpet out and started tearing walls out and tearing everything out, and and then it didn't look good. But the changes were for the good. Do you get what I'm trying to say? They weren't necessarily for good at the time, but they were for the good. So yesterday I spent about eight hours over there putting trim up and everything else and getting kind of the last things all together for in a two weeks for them to kick off their, their service in their new facility, their remodeled facility. So it's not for good, but for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. In Ephesians 1.11, it says he works everything after his will. In Psalm 110, 
or 102.25, it says he is unchanging. In Malachi 3.6, it says he does not change. So we find in scriptures that there are four very important proofs of God's faithfulness. Four very important proofs. First is God's covenants. God's covenants. We'll talk about them a little bit, but there's the the covenant with Abraham. There's the covenant with David. There's um, different covenants. There's the covenant with with us in the New Testament. So it's His covenants. The second is God's word. The third is God's works, and the fourth is the coming of God's Son. So we're just going to real briefly look at each one of those. The covenants of God, the word covenant comes from the Latin verb convenir, which means together and to come. Remember I said sometimes their words are flipped around, so it's to come together, if you think about it that way. In the scriptures, the word covenant comes from the Hebrew word beret in the Old Testament, and in the Greek diakata in the New Testament. But the Bible speaks of covenants between God and His people. It refers to promises that God has made, commitments that He has obligated Himself to fulfill without fail. And according to Scriptures, how faithful has God been in His covenants? Well, in Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says, very faithful to all generations. In 1 Kings 8, it says, He will fulfill everything that He has spoken. In Isaiah 54.10, it says His faithfulness will not be removed. And in Jeremiah 31.35 and then 33.20, He is faithful with His covenants to the point that he don't hold, if He don't hold up His end, that the covenant will not still be broken because He will not, he will not, not hold up His end. The Word of God is another proof of the faithfulness of God. Not one word that the Lord has spoken has ever failed. And some might question that. But we question it in our understanding. We don't look at it truly in the the fullness of His Word. God is faithful to fulfill every promise and to carry out every decree. I mean, who here can say that God really has ever failed them? We can think at times, maybe when we lose a loved one or we're going through battles ourselves that He's failed, but He's not failed. Remember, He didn't bring it on. He didn't bring it about. And He never failed in the fact of He said He will never leave us or forsake us. So it's through difficult times that He weeps with us, that He walks with us, that He he has His arms around us walking with us, and then at times bends down and picks us up and, and carries us through, and He's faithful at that. If we don't sense it, it's because we've pressed away from Him. James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. It's a continual drawing closer to Him, pushing into Him, pressing into Him. If we go through life just happenstance throughout the day, and then something bad happens and we don't experience God's presence like that, it's not because God has walked away from us. It's because we've walked away from Him because we haven't pressed into Him. When we come together to worship on Sunday morning, it's supposed to be about us pressing into Him recognizing who He is and offering ourselves to Him, that we would be able to experience His presence in a powerful way. Sometimes we make it into other things, and and it's really all about pushing into the face of God to experience all that He is. In Psalm 119, it says, His Word is settled. His faithfulness continues through all generations. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, everything else fades away, but God's Word stands forever. How does God's Word stand forever? 
In the New Testament, it says that God's Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do we know what that really means? Jesus is the Word. The Word became flesh. God sent Jesus to this earth to walk around this earth so that His Word would be fulfilled. He became the Word. He became the one that lived a sinless life. He became the one that that was able to illustrate to everyone what true holiness was. Even when Satan took him away for 40 days, and when Jesus went away to fast, and Satan comes and tries to tempt him, his relationship was so close with God, and he was the word that he could not, could not give in to Satan's attempt. And how did he fight the battle every time? Using the Word, because he was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And is now living forever. It goes beyond just the words that we see on this paper, but his life became the example that has shown us how to live and then was gave up his life to offer us what he had. It's a powerful picture. So we find that through the covenants of God that God is faithful. We find that through the word of God, God is faithful. We also find that in the works of God. It's often said that one's works verify or annul the faithfulness of one's word. Do you hear that? One's works verify or annul the faithfulness of one's word. We can go to somebody and say, I love you, but every time they need something, we're never around. Well, then our actions have just verified or annulled our faithfulness to that. We can say, I support God or I support the church, but then when the church calls out to or even God calls to us, we, we step away. And we say we're faithful, but our words are annulled because our actions speak louder than our words. I've always lived by the fact that if I can't do it, I'm not going to say I can do it. Because if I say I can do it, then I have to show that I can do it. In Psalm 33, 4, it says, The work will be accomplished through faithfulness. And we find out His works accomplish all things. See, we had the covenants. We had the Word of God. The Word of God, clear back in Daniel, said that there is going to be a Messiah coming, a Savior coming. It was spoken beforehand. It was prophesied. And, and Jesus did come. And Jesus died on the cross. And there are, there are historical facts that point to that. It's not just some fictitious book that we're reading that, that there's no uh, proofs that any of these things have happened. Many of the cities in Scripture that were, were available in the Old Testament are being found. Things that have, were spoken of in Scriptures have been found. They've even gone to the point that when uh, the space people were trying to figure out how to get into orbits and all of that, they kept finding that their, their timing kept being wrong and they couldn't understand why their timing was wrong. And they were able to finally figure it out when they went all the way back in Scripture and it said that God held the sun still for an hour. They added that hour in and everything came out right. There are, there are facts, there are proofs that, that the things of God existed and, and that when we see that through His Word and through His The last is the coming of God's Son. The greatest demonstration or proof of God's faithfulness is seen in the coming of His only begotten Son. From the very first chapters of the Scriptures, we find promises of His coming. We find promises of salvation. After 
thousands of years, all the promises were fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In Luke, many spoke of the of that soul that his soul exalts the Lord for the spirit rejoices in Jesus. In Luke again in one sixty eight it says it talks about the raising up of a horn of salvation. Christ has become our salvation. See the faithfulness of God is revealed through all of Scripture. In addition, there has never been one instance in all of history when God was not absolutely faithful to every word He has spoken. David talked many times of trusting Him because He was faithful. When God said He was going to do something, He did it. And He accomplished what He said He was going to do. The Scriptures frequently contrast the wisdom of trusting in God with the foolishness of trusting in self. In Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8, we find that all things will fade away because he trusts in man and not in God. Everything from man will become barren. God will have strong roots, but if we don't seek Him, they'll be wilted in order to produce fruit. We have to seek after and bear the spirit of truth. So what does all this mean? means that as we go through this life, regardless of what we experience, we can trust in the fact that God is faithful. We can trust in the fact that He is going to continue to follow through on the things that He's told us He will. Which means that when our life ends here, it doesn't end here. It means that we will stand before God Himself and it talks in Scripture about Him being a judge and He's going to look at our life. And the way we lived our life is then going to determine our destination. We can't blame that on God. It's not His fault that people don't go to heaven. He's given us every opportunity to seek Him. He's given us every opportunity to choose Him. Choose this day whom you will serve. And Isaiah said, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. I remember back on the day I was baptized. Our church didn't have a baptismal at the time, so we went to a church over uh, in one of the neighboring cities. I was a young 20-year-old, but God had really gotten a hold of my heart. I had the opportunity to stand before my church family and, and be baptized as a symbol of the change that had taken place. And I remember standing there that night, looking just like I'm looking at you with my church family, and I said, this is the day that I choose. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. had no idea what that was going to bring about at that time. But God has been so faithful. He's taken me in places I never thought that I would ever go. Sometimes I wasn't all that happy about it. But when I look back through my life, I can know that I was faithful to Him. I sought to do His will. I sought to love Him with everything that I am. I sought to love others like myself. Oh, that when I take my last breath here, that I'm going to stand before Him and I'm going to drop on my knees and worship Him. If I'm honored at that point for Him to hand me a crown of thorns, I'll lay it at His feet. Not of thorns. Crown of jewels. Sorry. 
don't want a crown of thorns. That I would humbly lay it at His feet and say just being here with you is all I need. Do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? Do you truly believe He's faithful? I'm sure we all could stand up and tell stories of His faithfulness in our lives. There may be some here today that are seeking to still find that even in the midst of their situation. He is faithful. When we recite the Lord's Prayer, we say every time that, you know, His rod and His staff, they comfort us. That He anoints our head with oil. Our cup overflows. He desires that mercy would follow us all the days of our lives. And then I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm not ready to leave here. But i got to tell you, I'm excited to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't know what it looks like, but I know my God. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. I want to be there with every one of you. With everyone that I've come in contact with in my past to be able to celebrate that time together and live for eternity. Then our heads will really be able to then grasp what it is to live forever and to go beyond just this portion of time that we're given here. God is faithful. I pray that even if you have a hard time memorizing Scripture, that I'll speak some scriptures enough that you can't get them out of the, your head. So remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I got it right here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. I don't have all of that on here. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Another one says He will direct your path. It's another translation. You can trust Him. He'll take you to places. Anybody ever go to Cedar Point and get on those roller coasters and you just kind of hang on for dear life and, and hope that you don't die? Well, I know when I've truly put my full trust in God, it's like that. You hang on for dear life and you're, on, you're, you're just going. You're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it, but on the way there it's going to be awesome. I'm going to be screaming and clapping and hollering all the way. And, and then when it ends, I'm going to stand before him and we can high five and say, that was an awesome ride. Because I feel like my life has been an awesome ride. And not because I'm awesome. Because I'm not. I'm kind of a mess. But he's awesome. And he's faithful. And he's true. And He just wants us to embrace Him and accept Him and trust Him. So, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all of your ways. Not some of your ways. All of your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Lord, You are amazing. I love You with everything that I am. I'm sorry for the times that I let you down. I'm sorry for the times that in my humanness I fail. But I know that in the midst of that, you don't love me because of what I do or don't do. You love me because you made me. And your word says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made by your hands. And so are all of my brothers and sisters here. May you draw close to each one in a mighty way. May they be excited about living their lives for you. May they be excited to learn more about you and to seek you out even more. And as you, your word says, as we seek you, we will find you. And the more we seek you, the more of you we will find. And you will be in our midst and we'll experience greatness because of who you are. 
We love you. Thank you for your great love for us. Go with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.